Thank you very much, John, and uh, good morning, uh, everybody. It's great to see you all here today. Can I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this morning, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects and my thanks to their elders past and present. It really is a great pleasure to be here this morning. Managing and leading the health portfolio must be one of the most difficult, if not daunting, jobs in Australia. So I, for one, will be very interested to hear from the Federal Health Minister, the Honourable Susan Lee, about how she sees the challenges facing the Australian health system going forward. Curtin University believes that we are doing our bit to assist in meeting these challenges through our extensive involvement in health education, research and community engagement. Our Faculty of Health Sciences boasts the widest scope of practitioner training for health professionals in Western Australia. We enrolled almost 12,000 students and had 2,400 course completions in 2014. And we're very proud of the fact that we educate more health professionals than any other WA tertiary institution. We're also at the forefront of innovative course delivery. We were the first in Australia to introduce an interprofessional education curriculum. That means that Curtin Health graduates understand that their profession is not an isolated area of knowledge and skills, but they have an important role to play as part of an integrated health team. So in their first year, all Curtin Health Science students complete a common set of core units that provide them with a grounding for health professionals that will see them as being industry ready. This includes a core unit on Indigenous culture and health. And of course, this impressive history is going to be augmented with the new Curtin Medical School, which the Prime Minister announced in May. Curtin's medical degree will be the only undergraduate entry program in the state, and it will have a strong emphasis on primary care, which will position our graduates well for rural and remote practice, as well as outer suburban locations where we know there is an acute shortage of doctors. The Faculty of Health Science also includes renowned national centres in drug research, public health advocacy, evidence and impact, accident research and biosciences. And Curtin has expertise in health economics, supported by the Bank West Curtin Economics Centre and federalism, a crucial aspect of health policy at JCIPP. We pride ourselves in being actively engaged in order to achieve mutual benefits for our students and the broader community. A recent example is our work with the City of Coburn, where we have a number of initiatives that are strategically linked involving clinical placements, research and external engagement. The City of Coburn has been supported financially by the WA Department of Sport and Recreation and I'm very pleased to acknowledge that the Director General of the Department, Ron Alexander, is with us this morning. Just to briefly describe one of the initiatives, we have an agreement with the Fremantle Dockers that enables ongoing placement opportunities for physiotherapy and exercise science students and access to the Dockers' new elite training facility at Coburn Central West. And as you can imagine, these are very desirable placements for our students. Fremantle staff also have access to our academic staff and infrastructure in the areas of multimedia, exercise science, sports medicine and other disciplines. <coughs> so overall, as a university, we do believe that we're contributing to Australia's health system and improving Australians' health and welfare. But we know that the context in which we are operating is very complex and it's changing. So that's why we are delighted to have the opportunity to hear from our distinguished guest this morning. According to her website, Minister Susan Lee is a traveller and an adventurer with a wealth of life experience. She was born in Nigeria to British parents and spent her early childhood in the United Arab Emirates before migrating to Australia at the age of 13 with her parents and her brother. She was schooled in the UK, Queensland and the ACT. Before entering federal parliament, her career path was wonderfully varied and included an early fascination with the skies and flying, 
which led to her obtaining a commercial pilot's licence, which she still holds. This interest led to work as an air traffic controller, aerial stock musterer, as well as life on the land as a shed hand, shearer's cook, through a large chunk of rural Australia. She spent 17 years on a livestock and dairy farm partnership in North East Victoria. Starting university when her first child turned one, she did 10 years of part-time study on the way to three children and three finance degrees, including a Master of Taxation Law and a Master of Accounting. Minister Lee worked for the Australian Taxation Office at Albury before being pre-selected for the Liberal Party to contest the federal seat of Farrah in 2001. She won that election by 206 votes and has been re-elected four times. Minister Lee held several shadow portfolios from 2004 before taking on the role of Assistant Minister for Education after the Coalition Government was elected in 2013. She was then appointed as Minister for Health and Minister for Sport in December 2014. With a background like that, it's obvious that she comes to her portfolio well equipped with a wide range of experience and we are very pleased to welcome her as our guest speaker this morning. Thank you very much, Deborah, for that lovely introduction to you and Jonathan and your team at Curtin. Uh, thank you for the work you do in this important public policy institute, and I'm delighted to be here. Can I acknowledge the traditional owners and say that as Federal Health Minister, I understand that the health of our first Australians is inextricably linked to their connection with their country. Um, we've had a wonderful um, two and a half days here in Perth. I'm here with a couple of my team and we're packing quite a bit in. Um, we spent the first day in the city. Um, the highlight was probably a pharmacy round table in Gosnells where um, uh, frank and fearless opinions were expressed. I didn't mind that at all. And uh, yesterday we flew to Kalgoorlie and then Esperance, one of the uh, privileges of being able to get around is that you can uh, cover a bit of ground when you want to and my only problem is I always want to be sitting at the front of the plane uh, so I usually sit behind the pilot watching very closely. Uh, unlikely that a 20 something year old is going to have a sort of massive, car massive cardiac arrest but if they do I'm there, um, licensed and dangerous. So um, it, it really has been a good opportunity to cover the, not all of the issues because um, there are so many but the important issues around <coughs> rural workforce, whether it be doctors or allied health professionals, the challenges, the unique challenges that you face in the West with distance and isolation. Um, we, we visited The Flying Doctor, a organisation well known to me because they operate out of Broken Hill, which is in my electorate of Farrah. And my electorate covers a third of Western New South Wales and is about the size of New Zealand, but that means nothing over here. Um, <laughs> And distances here are so much greater. And so I am determined to understand the issues that you all face and make sure that public policy from Canberra reflects your needs. Um, the Commonwealth uh, spends more on health than any other portfolio apart from welfare. And I suspect that we're catching up pretty fast. The last federal budget, our total spend is forecast to rise um, in just one year to about $69 billion. Unlike welfare, when you put more money in, people tend to get something in return in the form of increased pensions or benefits. Increased spending in health tends to mean that people are sicker. As Federal Health Minister, I would much prefer to ensure that our health dollars are used as efficiently as possible and that we're doing all we can to ensure that Australians get the right care in the right place at the right time. From individuals to our national economy, our health has a major direct impact on productivity and good health also gives us the intangible but overwhelming benefit of quality of life. To quote from Australia's Health 2014, our health as a nation depends on our health as individuals and vice versa. A healthy health system, therefore, is fundamental to our national and personal well-being and prosperity. Australia is fortunate to have an excellent health system put in place during the last century. 
but it's time to review that system and determine how we can build a health system that is responsive to the needs of patients in the 21st century. We need a health system for the 21st century that suits our economic environment, our social environment and our health environment. From Australia's health again. In 2011-12, health spending in Australia was estimated to be $140.2 billion or 9.5% of GDP. The amount was around 1.7 times as high as in 2001-2002, with health expenditure growing faster than population growth. This growth can be attributed in part to societal changes, such as population ageing, and to increased prevalence of chronic conditions, diseases and risk factors. Personal incomes, broader economic trends and new technologies also affect spending on health. In summary, our health does not exist separate to the rest of our society. And when we talk about our health system, we need to understand that the bulk of total health spending in this country, almost 70% is provided by governments. On the latest figures, the Australian Government contributes 42.4% and state and territory governments 27.3%. At the heart of Commonwealth spending and of the system itself is Medicare. Since Medicare started in 1984, modelled on Medibank, which was developed even earlier, our society has changed hugely. Our health needs have changed, our health spending has grown enormously, but our health system has not been modified and adjusted to match those changes. The time has come to update the system to ensure that it remains relevant and functional. Because the government is serious about protecting our health system, including Medicare and the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, we've made a number of reform decisions and begun other reform processes. These will improve the operation of the system without cutting services and benefits. In general terms, we are making the health system more efficient for patients, providers and taxpayers. We are ensuring that government funding is targeted to producing the best results for patients. And we are shifting the focus to primary care, where we can make a huge difference to our health by putting more effort into preventing disease rather than just curing it. So let's start with Medicare. It's a core and well-supported part of our health system and in fact our society. But unlike most things that we cherish, it has not been well maintained. It has been allowed to grow to an unwieldy size, has not been properly safeguarded from abuse and has not been upgraded to deal with modern diseases. Conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, asthma, kidney disease, some cancers, musculoskeletal diseases, respiratory problems and depression are now responsible for the majority of our burden of disease and their incidence continues to rise. It's not the fault of our excellent doctors, but Medicare's fee-for-service model is simply not geared to helping people to prevent or manage these conditions. The government has taken action to get Medicare back into order and at the same time rebuild and reinvigorate primary health care, which includes GPs and other health professionals that you can see without a referral. Primary care accounts for more than 38% of total health spending in Australia, only slightly less than hospitals, which account for 40.4%, but attract a lot more attention. Firstly, we've begun the most comprehensive review ever undertaken of the Medicare benefits schedule. The MBS Review Task Force will consider more than 5,500 services listed on the MBS and whether they are in line with contemporary clinical evidence. At the same time, there will be a review, a review of the education provided to doctors about MBS items and the rules about using them. Secondly, I have also set up a primary health care advisory group to consider possible new ways of providing and funding primary health care, especially for people who are chronically ill and need a range of services. A more integrated approach to care is essential with patients able to have seamless access to general practice in combination with a range of essential allied healthcare services. That means GPs working with allied health practitioners such as dietitians, podiatrists, physiotherapists and others for the good of their shared patients. Obviously, in any discussion of approaches to care, funding models will also be discussed. 
but the primary focus must and will remain ensuring that Australia's patients are receiving an improved standard of care in the primary setting. I'm expecting the final report of the Primary Healthcare Advisory Group and the interim report of the MBS review within six months. These reports will mesh into other changes in primary health care. From the start of this month, we have a network of new organisations across Australia to guide, promote and provide improvements to local primary care services. The 31 primary health networks replace Medicare Locals, which in turn built on the Australian General Practice Network. They will play a leading role in coordinating health services to make them work more effectively and efficiently for patients, especially people at risk of or living with chronic conditions. The PHNs will receive close to $900 million in operational and flexible funding over the next three years, plus additional program funding. Compared to Medicare Locals, they will be more focused on supporting local GPs and other frontline health services through a commissioning model, rather than being frontline providers themselves. They will use flexible funding and innovative models of service delivery to fill service gaps where needed and to coordinate care between primary care and the hospital setting. So we are changing the structures and levers in the health system, important changes that will make a difference. We're also looking for a cultural shift in our health and medical workforce and in our own attitudes to health. We need to put patients at the centre of the health process and ensure their care is coordinated across an episode of ill health. This type of coordinated care is evidenced in the new arrangements for pharmacy in Australia. Pharmacists are everywhere. They are close to their communities and they represent a section of the skilled health workforce which is underutilised. They already provide health services such as home medicine reviews and in certain circumstances can teach people with type 2 diabetes how to use their medications and their devices. There is scope for pharmacists to expand their role in supporting consumers in responsible self-care in areas where the high skills and training of doctors are not required without in any way compromising patient safety. This would not only reduce the workload on GPs but reduce the cost of these services to Medicare and the taxpayer. The recently finalised six community pharmacy agreement will support an expanded healthcare role for community pharmacy and pharmacists. It provides $1.26 billion over five years for a range of continuing, new or expanded pro pharmacy programs and services. It enables pharmacists to apply for funding to implement new programs and services which will be subject to assessment for both cost effectiveness and benefits for patients. A particular focus for the continuing and expanded community pharmacy programs will be services to benefit Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and consumers in rural and remote areas. Both of these groups struggle to get access to the care they need. Making pharmacists part of a primary care team with the doctor at the centre makes good sense. Pharmacists are also crucial in delivery of PBS medicines. It's vital that taxpayers get the best value for their investment in the PBS. Already reforms to the pricing of medicines subsidised by the government have saved taxpayers billions of dollars. Further reforms are now being implemented, including mechanisms to better improve the price disclosure process. Cost savings to government make it possible to add new, often very expensive drugs to the PBS to ensure that Australian patients have affordable access to the latest proven medicines. Consumers are also benefiting directly. The government has recently taken action which will cut the price of more than 2,000 brands of common medicines from October next year. These reforms will ensure that Australians are not paying too much for their essential medicines. We also want to make sure they're getting good value for money out of private health insurance. It makes no sense to expect governments to increase the share of health funding they provide when we have a viable and high quality private health and hospital sector. Health insurers already play an important role in funding private health services, supporting consumer choice and innovation. Insurers also have a vested interest in keeping their clients healthy and out of expensive hospital care. There's an obvious crossover here with the reform themes that I've mentioned. 
I believe there are possible expanded roles for private health insurers in improving access to primary care, preventative health, self-care and chronic disease management. There are other important areas where reform is underway, such as eHealth, the personally controlled electronic health record, which we have renamed My Health Record and which will now proceed under an opt-out model, not the previous government's opt-in model. The review of the Federation arrangements, being led by the Prime Minister in a leaders' retreat coming up in a few weeks, and national plans for mental health and dental health. All of these will tie in with the general trends that I've outlined to make our health system more efficient and effective in keeping people healthy to reduce our future demands for care. Yes, we are consulting, but we're also moving ahead. Reform is underway now. The next generation for Australia's health system is on its way. Thank you.